an issue came up in our Zoom meeting yesterday. One of the people was commenting on how he first encountered the questionnaire about things being anichan dukkha anatta. Anichan usually was translated as impermanent. And the question is, if something is impermanent, is it easeful or stressful? And he said he didn't see any direct connection between things being impermanent and stressful. There are a lot of things that, because they're impermanent, it's actually good. When your disease is impermanent, that's a good thing. When a bad situation of any kind is impermanent, that's a good thing. But when you translate anicca as inconstant, that helps you to see the connection. If something is inconstant, it's undependable, unreliable. John Cha's translation in Thai is my na, which means it's not for sure. When you see that something is unreliable, then you realize, okay, it is stressful. Whatever comfort you've gained from it so far, you can't depend on. It's going to change at some point, and you don't know when, which means you have to be prepared. As we chanted just now, the world is swept away. Time is passing. If you could see time pass, it would be whizzing right past you all the time. You would wonder, where can you settle in? Every place you settle in would be whizzing past, whizzing past. There's one theory, actually, that time passes at the speed of light, or space-time moves at the speed of light. And that's how time passes. So it's awfully fast, and there's nothing you can really hold on to. The Buddha gives an image of someone who's floating downstream with a flood. He's afraid of being swept away, so he tries to grab onto the grasses on the bank. But they're just grass. And either they get pulled out by the roots, or they have sharp edges and they cut his hands. And they end up getting swept away together with him. So when you live in a world like that, what are you going to do? Most people decide they're just going to pretend it's not happening. And they create their little worlds of security. Deep down inside, they know that those worlds are not secure. But they keep going for them anyhow. You know the story of King Garavya talking with Venerable Ratapala about why he ordained. And Ratapala points out, you know, the world is swept away, it does not endure, it offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. The world has nothing of its own. And he illustrates this with incidents from the king's life. The fact that he's aged, and when he means to set his foot one place, he goes someplace else. This was after he was endowed with superhuman strength when he was young. When he has a disease, his courtiers are standing there basically waiting for him to die. But he has no power of the disease to say, well, can you take out some of this pain that I'm feeling so I can feel less? Even though he's king, he has no sovereignty over his pains. And even though he has storerooms filled with gold and silver, he can't take that gold and silver with him when he dies. So he's been reflecting on these things that are inconstant, stressful, not self, subject to aging, illness, and death. And then Ratabala asks him, if someone were to come with word that there was a kingdom to the east, with a weak army but lots of wealth, and you could conquer it, would you go for it? And even though he's been reflecting on the impermanence of life and how he can't really hold on to it, he'd be willing to send his army out and kill and plunder so he could have more wealth. And as Ratapal points out, this is what it's meant by, we're a slave to craving. These things keep slipping past, slipping past, slipping past. We keep trying to come back to them because we don't see anything better. And when the Buddha tells us there is something better, we don't really believe him. It seems like that the path there is awfully stringent, requires a lot of us. But then just taking what seems to be the easy way out requires a lot of us too, because it means we're subject to the fears of what's going to happen when we die. If you haven't gained the Dharma yet, you're not really sure. You say you take refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, but do you really take refuge in them? or Where do you take your refuge? 
This is Jamabu. It says for most of us, reality is Gile Sang Sonaranga Chami. I take refuge in my defilements. Look for some fun in thinking about sensuality. Getting worked up, getting angry about something, there's a pleasure there. You get on the whole list of the defilements, and those are our refuge. It's like an addiction. You know that it's bad for you, but to make a change requires effort, and this part of you just does just too much inertia to make the change. So it's going to make you see that you really do have to make the change. How bad do things have to get? You look around. It seems like the world is falling apart. It always has been falling apart, but it seems especially obvious now. We've got crazy people in power who think that war is a good thing. Greed is a good thing. Lying is okay. We even have monks telling us that the Buddha didn't really mean that we should observe the precepts all the time. That there's a time when killing is a is a duty, a moral duty. So look at the world. It's swept away, swept away. What are you going to do so that you're not swept away with it? You've got the practice that's been laid out. It makes sense. So what's the obstacle? This is a question each of us has to ask ourselves. Because what you are, this being that you are, what you've taken on as your identity, it's just made out of a lot of clings and attachments to things like the grass on the side of the riverbank. The Buddha lists, I think it is, he lists five kinds of grass that would correspond to the five aggregates. And they all get pulled out as you try to grab on them as the flood washes you downstream. So where is your island? The Buddha says you try to establish your mindfulness, ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world, so you can get the mind into concentration. This gets you an island that gets you out of the flood for a bit, but you're still in the middle of the river. You haven't made it all the way across. But this gives you something to hold on to. And so you want to be really good at this. As John Lee used to say, there are people who manage huge farms, thousands of acres. You could have added there are people with corporations with many thousands of employees. They manage it to handle it. And here we have only four jhanas. He says, you can't catch hold of it right. Isn't that embarrassing? As a meditator, this is, should be something that you really have under your control. This is what you should master. At the very least, you should get up out of the flood a bit. And then look at what you've got. This island that you're on, it too can get washed away. But you don't want to go back into the flood. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? That's the challenge of discernment. But at the very least, get that island. That should be your main concern every day as you wake up. It's only then that you can begin to rely on yourself and keep your nostrils above the flood.